All right, so today is uh, March 7th, 2021, and we're going to continue our discussion on the Desiderata Extinction Nadi. Uh, we have an agenda today. Uh, we're going to wait on prions if uh, Dr. Kevin McCarn, um shows up. Uh, so right now we'll start with monetizing the ARG. So let's see. How should we start this? Uh... Well, <laughs> I um... want to read Gary's message. Oh. <laughs> oh. Wait. Do you want to read it, Mike? Or do you want me to read it or whatever? Or I don't it... <laughs> uh, do you do you want to read it or? <laughs> Yeah, I don't mind. I'll read it if you uh, like, because I've got it on my phone just now. They're here because it. Uh, we just got it now. Do you want? Uh, it's just a few minutes. It's, it's maybe a minute read, maybe less. Okay. Shall I go ahead? Yeah, yeah, go. Uh, REQ situation. I have a suggestion, which maybe Sophie and you can consider. It might sound rather silly. I don't even know myself how seriously or flippantly to take it. My intention. Uh, is that this could start a discussion and lead to something workable. The first part is that making some money by conventional means in an, in an economically terminal world isn't likely to get very far. Although I would love to, I don't see making Faraday phone covers or apocalyptic art is going to achieve much. I'm absolutely not a business person, me too, but why not just give people what they think they want even if they are misguided? What they want is something to cling to in times of uncertainty, like a cult. The extinctionati is already a cult, although not the usual type, of course. But what if people came to it and got co conned in a different way, ending up enlightened rather than dead? Now, Hugh knows all about how to run a conventional cult, and as he says, they're all we know anyway. So what about money then? The idea came out of that video recently about the order of the solar temple. They set aside some of their meetings for a special inner circle where supposedly very interesting stuff was going on, but anyone who wanted in had to pay up to get status, satisfy curiosity and advance in the cult. So my thought was, there are four meetings per month. Let's start the experiment by subscription only, except for us, we are the high priest around here. Set aside a juicy topic, leak vague but alluring details about it, and possibly take a leaf from Hugh's early videos with some theatric, uh, theatrical um, in attire. More conventionally, even a guest like Kevin McCann, with a very interesting message, could work as an inner circle event. I'll send a copy, etc. <laughs> Gary. <laughs> If everybody is okay with it, I'm okay with it. Me but, too. I think it's great. But here's the thing is though, we have to like pinky swear in blood on this, right? So uh, if, uh, if we start monetizing this, uh, everybody has to have an agreement that you basically can, we should try and be able to live off it, right? All of us, anybody involved should be able to essentially live off it, but not high on the hog, right? Not just basically a stipend to just be able to uh, devote your time to this, but basically not make out like a bandit and get rich on it. Okay, so so basically whatever you do, you, you just have an agreement that you will take what you need and you do a mutualist thing and you return any excess above your minimum needs back to the game or the cult. So is everybody in agreement on that, that it's a give and take thing that you just, you know, you're, you're on honor to just take what you need, but it would be really, really nice if people could get to a point where they could devote full time, uh, their full time to, to this cult and then basically um, just return the excess. So, let me tell you how it works normally in in an ashram and the traditional thing that goes back thousands of years to like the the vedic times we're talking as old as civilization and it's still carried on in like the mormon 
cult, <laughs> Church of the Latter Day Saints, <laughs> Scientology, and all these guys, and and even the cult that I was in. It's usually tithing. <clears throat> so the early Christians, all these people, they carried on uh, this by tithing. The idea was that you work in the world, and then you tithe. You give about ten percent after tax. You know, basically, see, you give unto Caesar what is Caesar, but. I, I I don't really like that at all. At all, I I think what my vision is and been for a long time is that the cult itself is as good as a corporation, and it could uh, grow organically and be self-sustaining in terms of, of money. So you should be able to get money out of the cult, right? So it's not like the normal thing where you do your duty in the world and you return 10% of the cult. I think it should be the other way around where you, this is your job and you can generate money. If we can get there, you, you could generate revenue and we would live off that modestly and then return all the rest. So it's kind of the other way around. So, so what, what do people think of that idea? Because it's a different time. It's not the same deal, right? It's not the same deal as... Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I said I'm 100% in agreement with what you say. I have nothing to add. That's exactly how I see the, the way to, 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 if we want to generate uh, a little bit of money so people can live uh, decently, modestly, and at the same time uh, divert and spend some time at, uh, at what we like and what we think feels right. Yeah, so so I think it's a different time. So it's it's not the old deal. The old deal was personal enlightenment. So you you know if you got world weary, um, it was an exception. One percent of one percent of people would go to an ashram and find a master and get enlightened, and it was very esoteric stuff. Uh, but it's not like that anymore. I think basically we're all headed for collapse, and we're all headed for possible extinction. So in those circumstances, it's not a personal enlightenment. It's kind of like we're working for everybody else in a way, not for us personally. I mean, in other words, you don't get anywhere if you become the, the best Buddha in the apocalypse. There's, there's no upside to being like, oh, my, you know, I don't give a fuck about the apocalypse. I'm all right. It's like, what the fuck are you talking about? So I think we should think in terms of like, we all kind of fucked. Everybody's going to be a Buddha at the end of this game. So then we just think of ourselves as being like the avant-garde of the Buddha. <laughs> just basically saying, we know this is all going to end in tears and gnashing of teeth. And we just got, got there early. So it's basically, we take that attitude and then we're more in the business of welcoming people into the Duma scenario rather than having them, uh, you know, offering this traditional escape from the mundane world. Um, so, yeah, what, what do people think of that view? Mm, I, I like it. I like the view. Um, I think it also, I don't know if this is going to, if I want to preface by saying that um, people, circumstances are different and um, I don't know how much people or even here can devote um, you know if they're working have family children um, yeah I don't know but for me personally um, I can find ways to navigate so um, it's fine yeah but I, I don't know everyone else's situation yeah you see I think that an ARG is so open-ended and there's so many different ways that you can approach it that I think it can accommodate anybody's needs, really. So it doesn't really matter what your circumstances are because the way I see it is like, you know, if, if this is all going to turn into a big crunch, uh, really what we should be doing as a group is saying, you know, do everybody's bucket list, everything like Jim will fix it kind of thing. And they basically saying like, if, if you have a passion or a passion project, you can work it into an ARG. So it's not the old thing where you have to sacrifice yourself. It's, say like, this is my dream. And we work as a team to make everybody's you know, bucket list dream 
come true. So, so it's, uh, you know, we're basically, we serve each other to make sure we can do what we want to do in the apocalypse and, and carry it on, you know, as if we can expand it and have people join, we do, we do the same thing. But I, I mean, I'm assuming here that your passion project is something reasonable, like, you know, you, you've always wanted to do a book or you always wanted to go to a place or something modest. I'm not assuming you wanted to be king of the world or you wanted to be a movie star. Or, like, I wanted to be a billionaire. Uh, I'm assuming something human and modest. Say, I, like, I always wanted a vegetable garden or something. I always wanted to go to see, uh, you know, so if it's, if it's realistic, then I think we, we you, you can fold it into the game so that it becomes achievable. It's kind of vision that I have, if, if, if it makes sense to people. A very clear vision to me. I don't know if anybody else can see it. Yeah, but, I, I'm just starting to see it. Um, my, my kind of, I guess, goals are becoming more modest as time goes along. So that's why I could yeah. say I could um, navigate. Um, so, yeah. Even well, to the see, point. What, what, I'm, I'm prepared to go on a limb and promise this, that that if you keep your, the, the key to happiness is keeping your goals, you know, modest. Uh, basically, any happiness uh, a theoretician will tell you that basically the key to happiness is low expectations. People that, you know, are disabled or in wheelchairs and stuff are happier than the general population. And the reason is that the expectations are low. So if you lower your expectations, then basically that's the key to happiness. But I'll go out on a limb and I'll tell you this. If you lower your expectations and start working for, for a project like this and fold it into something bigger, uh, it will feed on itself. If other people join, then basically it will feed uh, whatever you desire. And eventually you'll lose your personal ego desire for some bucket list object. And it's kind of like you will kind of be more in tune and going with the flow of what people want in general anyway. So it beca it's becomes a self-feeding thing where, you know, people start off with these, we really kind of refugees and um, traumatic victims of the system. And when people come out of the system, they're fucked up by the system. So they have fucked up goals and aspirations and viewpoints and ideas and stuff. But as those melt down, which should happen <laughs> if this cult is done properly, as those melt down, you, then you get everything you want. Here's the kicker. You get everything you want because you're wanting nothing else that hap other than what happens. So in other words, what you want and desire in the world is what happens anyway. So you, you, you basically, it's kind of like giving thanks for what you get. And so basically, you are completely in line, like you are in line with Kairos, you're in line with the time. And also you say, this is exactly what I want. And you say, well, how can that be exactly what you want? It's fuck all and say, I wanted exactly what the universe gave <laughs> and gave universe gave fuck all. And that's exactly what I wanted. Hooray, it's Christmas. I, I don't know if that makes any sense to anybody, but I can promise you that it will one day. <laughs> well, it, it makes, I, I understand what you mean. It, for me, it makes sense. And uh, maybe my age, I've seen that happening with the way I've lived and, and, and knowing my expectations to be actually very, very small. I, I know, I know what you mean. And especially when it comes to a group dynamic, um, I, I, I'm trying to grasp, I, what I don't grasp very well is how you want to fold that into into an arc, but that could be exciting to find out, you know? Oh, yeah, I, I have lots of ideas on that. But as long as we understand the, the principle, it's very it's much easier for older people to understand and people that have had kids. Because as you get older, you know, you start off as a young Turk and you, you know, have all these egotistical ambitions normally. As you get older, you live less and less for yourself. You become more and more self-sacrificing and you live more for your kids and other people. So eventually, by the time you get you know, really old, you're really living for the sake of other people. And that's really the key to happiness. Unfortunately, drastically lost in our Western <laughs> egotistical capitalist hellhole. <laughs> but you see, if we find our way back to that um, as a group, it becomes infectious, and I can promise you that. Okay, so now how, how do we actually do it? Well, I 
I can tell you a, a, a dynamite way um, of doing it, and I, I, I'm hesitant now because it's it's going to suck all my time. <laughs> Here's what I suggest: is the best way to do it is to basically fuel the game with a currency. So we we have like a Bitcoin, but I suggest the exact opposite of Bitcoin, just to be contrary. <laughs> Um, but we have an anti-Bitcoin, and it's a currency like uh, fake money that fuels the game. Now, um, I've done all this already. I did all this with uh, with Geodo. The, the the reason why uh, the I, I shut down all the servers and stopped doing, you know stopped it all, although it was all complete and working. Uh, the reason was it was costing me hundreds a month on Amazon Web Services to keep it all up. And nobody would do it because nobody wants to get involved in the currency because, you know, it's a chicken and egg situation. You know, there's nothing you can buy. Basically, it's geodollars as the currency. It's nothing you can buy with geodollars, so nobody wants to bother to work to get them because there's nothing you can do with them. Here's where I was always going. I just never had the time to get that. And that is to have a gold exchange, make the uh, geo dollars, uh, you know, auction off gold and silver, and you know that gives people incentive to go out and get geo dollars. How they would get geo dollars is basically, you know, really scavenger hunts and doing stuff in the game. It's basically think of it like you know Chuck E. Cheese. If you go. Does any nobody in the UK or anything? Nobody outside the US knows what Chuck E. Cheese is. Is that right, Mike? Is it's just an American thing, right? I don't know. I'm I'm in America, so I know about it. <laughs> no. Well, well, okay. So, <laughs> so what Chuck E. Cheese is? If you go to Chuck E. Cheese, it's kind of like you, you want to describe it. How you just basically you go to this place, you kids go, they play all these games, they get all these useless tickets, and then the tickets allow them to buy crap in, <laughs> in the store. In Chuck e. Cheese. So it's the same kind of thing. You go through all these games in the ARG, you get this currency, which is like Chuck E. Cheese tickets, and then at the end of the day, you check them in and you can buy some crap for millions of tickets to buy <laughs> some teddy bear. <laughs> And so it's this, in principle, it's the Chuck E. Cheese principle. And I, and I think that's also how we get around the legal obstacles and FinCEN and stuff like that is that it's just a fake currency for the game. Oh, did you know there's somebody standing behind you, Sophie? <laughs> it's, a, it's Klaus Schwab. Is Klaus Schwab there with you? <laughs> you're muted, Sophie. You you muted. You you muted. Maybe Sorry, yes. Yeah. So I said it's my brother-in-law, and he brought me a glass of wine. And uh, can he just uh, his next door painting? And I'll, I'll, have I'll have one. <laughs> Cheers! Cheers! <laughs> The, use, the internet is useless. Digital wine is crap, I can tell you. Oh, yeah. And, but for what about digital currency? <laughs> well, so, okay, so so the idea is that basically, yeah, it's a digital currency, and basically you you do everything like, like Faraday wallets and joke products and ridiculous shit and all sorts of shit. Basically, you give rewards in the currency for the game and for... Tasks. Um, so, so there's a thing called Mechanical Turk. Um, has anybody heard about Mechanical Turk? Yeah, you you yeah, I, it a I while used to do some Mechanical Turk. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so if, if, I don't know if you've ever tried Mechanical Turk, but anybody I ever spoke to who tried Mechanical Turk sounds that like you get, you get about five cents an hour for yeah. doing shit tasks. But anyway, what Amazon Turk is 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 Jeff Bezos. And Amazon has this thing called Mechanical Turk. It's named after this chess playing robot that was a real thing in the 19th century. They had this little guy who, you know, a little person, you're not allowed to say midget anymore. But anyway, the little midget. And he's sitting inside the chess game, and nobody knew that he was there pulling the levers. They said there was this magical AI, you know, computerized system. We're talking like, you know, 19th century here, steam driven. But people were pretty gullible. 
you know, less gullible than they are today, but <laughs> they were still gullible. And, and so then they thought that this was a, a chess machine, you know, before even computers were invented, they thought that this machine was playing chess and beating, you know, that little guy inside the machine was a really good chess player and he could see all the pieces up above. So, they, so anyway, Mechanical Turk was this uh, guy who's right working the machine on the inside manually that looks like um, really a digital chess playing machine and that's what they, and so that's why Amazon Web Services Mechanical Turk is called that because they outsource you can go and you know work as a gig employee on Amazon on Amazon Web Services and uh, Mechanical Turk and what you do is you take these tasks that people have given you and they're often things like psychologists use them. Almost all psychological experiments now are done on, on Amazon. Too. So in the old days, they used to go to a college and they used to go and, you know, all the, 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 psych, um, the psych department would go to all the psych students and they would do this, you know, game theoretic uh, analysis, all these kind of um, experiments that were psychological. And then they'd, you know, generate all these papers. The re it's it wasn't very good because they they realized that college kids in psych classes in the U.S. were not very very representative of the average person, especially ethnic people. So so they called it weird. White educated. Um, I can't remember what weird stands for. White educated, uh, industrialized. But anyway, they realized that the their uh, the, the experimental subjects were weird. And so they since then have corrected it in the last 10 years by almost everybody does their research on um, Mechanical Turk. And what it means is essentially it means that there are lots of people, particularly in third world countries in Africa and in India, um, there are people sitting there are asking these psychological questions like, you know, all the the crap that you would do to generate data that allows you to write a psych paper. So that's one of the things. There's lots of, it's basically digital bit work. It's basically crap work. Um, and you, you give very little money for doing these repetitive tasks that are slightly beyond um, artificial intelligence and just capable of what a human can do. And so, so then that's what, um, uh, mechanical Turk is. But now, same thing applies, but not for doing crap work for, you know, Amazon customers, uh, corporate customers. The, the idea is that you, you, you know, people that participate in the game, people that are sucked into trailheads and rabbit holes and stuff, is is they would do similar tasks for Geodo instead of US dollars. So you could get people to, it, it's a feedback loop because the more you said to people like, you know, basically you'd put tasks up uh, and distribute them to people say like, hey, I want you to geocache this part of the game in India or in Bangladesh and in Myanmar. And basically, I, I want, you know, Japan, whatever you say, like put this poster up on a, you know, on a street somewhere in Tokyo, take a picture of it, send it back to me, and I'll give you 10 dollars. So it's, it's that kind of thing. Um, and then, the you know, that, that not only gets people into the game generating the currency, but they also, from the poster, it's a trailhead that leads people into a kind of doing mechanical type of things into the game. Does it, is it, am I making sense so far? Where, where is it? Okay. Yeah. So, so then, uh, yeah, but what, what gets it off the ground is just pure old fashioned Ponzi scheme greed. And that's basically is an exchange. So the bit I didn't do with the currency, and this is where the time suck comes on me, is, um, is doing uh, the exchange. So basically it would be things where you could get gold and silver coins is how I imagine it. We put them up for sale if anybody could could basically send us um, a, a gold or silver coin and we would put them on, on the exchange and people would buy them. They would auction them just like on uh, eBay. You would auction them for geodollars. And then that's what gives the geodollar its value. 
Uh, so in essence, it may, means that it's exchangeable for gold and the whole currency supply would be regulated by the gold price. Does that make sense? It's basically exactly what China's doing now to try and get out of dollar hegemony. We're doing the same thing. But our protection from, you know, basically to do this, you need to be a licensed banker, the, you know, exchange controls and basically know your own customer. There's a lot of regulations for doing, uh, is the reason why people can't do this kind of thing. But we're doing what Chuck E. Cheese is doing. So it's really a fake currency in a game. Though, like everything in an ARG, it's right on the edge of what's fake and what isn't. Right? So, the, so in essence, the, the currency is worthless. It only has merit within the game. But does it? Do, 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 do. <laughs> On the other hand, it is exchangeable for real gold. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So that's what you were doing with your first videos um, when you started um, well, two years ago. You had this kind of, uh, at the beginning, you were explaining that you were doing geo. Uh, dough and that it was exchangeable for gold. So that was, is that what was behind it? Because I, I didn't understand yeah, that. I'm, I'm talking about reviving that. So if you go to the first videos in the series, yeah. they're full of Easter eggs. If you go and have a look, they're letters hidden craftily in each one of the scenes, right? They, they, nobody's got to the end of that trail. So, so basically there are 12 gold coins offered through those videos. Nobody got to the end. I met people that said, I'm going to get to the end. I met, I met a Dutch guy who was sailing around Greece. He was absolutely determined to get through it. He never got through it. So they very, you have to go through almost frame by frame to see those things. But if you, they, they, in every single one, right up to the, the Gebekli Tepe, there's, um, uh, there's the Easter eggs, uh, my, two or three in each one of the videos. And, Maybe and it's good to start to resurrect, uh, because that's a lot of work that you have done in those first videos. Honestly, I really, I watch them again. I mean, I know other people who are watching them, you know, several times, but you've got already a lot of the work done there. And... We, we maybe you could we could build it, it, you can actually follow all of the nobody's followed them right to the end so nobody's mm -hmm. got to the end of those but but you can actually still follow those to the end and if you do basically i will send you some geodo i'll i'll resurrect it and send it well but uh actually yeah if you can get to the end i'll give you a gold coin of, of maple but the um but the um yeah, so it's basically I'm I'm talking about resurrecting it, but the piece that I didn't get to was the exchange. So it means that you can exchange shit for geoda, and the shit I think is silver and gold, especially in this climate. So I think it might be just coming to the point where this makes a hell of a lot of sense. So the idea would be that that yeah we. we, we sell stuff for geoda, and I'm talking about everything just complete wacko products that even joke products and the idea must be really edgy that people can't tell whether it's it's a real thing or not um so there so for example one the some of the products i thought of were, were they i like the idea of them being politically edgy and controversial so for example like uh one of the products i thought of was it basically offer I don't know if there's a real thing behind it or not. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't a real product that you can go and buy, but at least the advertisement for it would go something like this. You, you, you know how in America, the, the medical establishment is, the medical and healthcare system in America is so broken, it's not even funny. It, it, you, people outside of America wouldn't believe how bad it is. But basically, if you're an old person in America or you have some health problem you you've got to get these immensely expensive drugs they're basically holding you to ransom for your life it's like it's like charging a hundred dollars to throw somebody a life belt that's drowning it's it's just incredible how how bad it is a lot of people are spending thousands on medications there's no assistance from the government or anything people are going bankrupt people are committing suicide because they can't afford the medication so anyway yeah, that's the that's the the thing, the political situation. 
here's my, you know, activism style, spoof style, political statement about it. It just so happens that if you look at it medically, most of the pharmaceuticals that people take, they're going to piss them out. What happens is they get used by your body. They don't get broken down by your body. You just piss them out. So you take these expensive pills that you're paying a thousand bucks a month for. In general, they, they're things that you have to up the prescription on every month, right? So things like take opioids. You take an opioid, basically it, it's an analgesic. It stops a bit of pain. You piss it out. A hundred percent of it gets pissed out raw and solid. It, it's basically in your urine. It's perfect, usable, basic, ba ba basically. Um, you know, uh, whatever the the thing is, uh, what what's it called? The the opioid that the Sackler family does, whatever that thing is called. Anyway, you piss it, you use it, your brain uses it, and you piss it straight out, and you pay thousands of months for this shit. Here's the thing: why piss it out? You sell a kit that for for basically where you can distill. It's basically like you you distill your own pee, and you, you get out the. So you don't have to go and up the prescription. You just take the crystals out of the bottom, put them back in water, and take them back in and save a bunch. <laughs> you can double your prescription. You can do it every single day. You don't have to go back to the doctor and keep getting a new prescription and paying more money. You can just recycle it yourself. That's all the sectors. In fact, the shit that you're pissing out is probably – better than the raw materials that go into the Sackler family factory that actually manufactures, you know, basically this Oxycontin and shit. Anyway, am I wrong about this, Sophie? You're the medical person. Now, I wouldn't say that's 100% uh, because it's a little bit that must be broken down during absorption and all that. But, yeah, a lot of those drugs, they go on receptors and they block, they do the action that they wanted and then they're eliminated again by the kidney. The only ones that are not is the ones that are broken down in the in the liver. But the ones that are in the kid that are bro yeah, there's a percentage in the kidney that might lose a bit because of chemical but, reactions. Things like opioids. Yeah. I don't I don't know about yeah. Lipitol and stuff. But I mean, a lot of people are surviving on Lipitol, and, stuff. and it, yeah. it, you can just get fifty percent out of it. Or probably more. And you look at the contraceptive pill. Um, they've right. done some measurements in in the environment, and they know that the the urine is. Uh, is polluting the, the even though I'm, I'm an advocate of contraception, but it's still going to give you know a, 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 a catastrophic effect on fish and animals and humans in the environment. That's for sure. But all those estrogen mimics and those, oh, yeah, uh, those yeah, yeah. they come out of the and go straight into the sea and makes you know make all the seals female, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so in principle, it's it's not a bad even if it's just a complete spoof joke thing. In I know. principle, you could actually have a kind of a coffee it's distiller like, thing that you know. Would you like to propose that to XI and for recycling because they really like that sort of stuff? Yeah, it's <laughs> perfect, you know. yeah why don't they do shit like this? But you know, in India, people drink their urine uh, regularly for treatments. Yeah, and Gandhi, so. Gandhi did it. When, when I went yeah. to India, I, um, I basically I met these guys that were full on. They were more full on Gandhi than XR is. And I, I, I read up a lot about Gandhi, so I knew he he started out in South Africa. And I don't like Gandhi at all. He's a con man. But anyway, you can't say that in the Western world. But Gandhi's a straight on comment, but one of the, the I knew all the embarrassing shit. One of the embarrassing shit was uh, that pe blows people away, especially in Britain, is he was actually a sergeant in the British Army and got decorated for basically you know massacring Zulus. <laughs> they don't know that. <laughs> and the other thing they don't know is that like he molested all these women. He basically he liked young woman and he would get into bed naked with them and then basically say that was testing him but you know oh he would always fail the test oh damn <laughs> we have to do it again tomorrow night <laughs> and the other, they they're very embarrassed about that and the other thing they're embarrassed about it particularly in india they're embarrassed is that he drank his own piss he loved drinking his own piss so i would ask them about all this and they would have kittens because 
I would be with other Western people that they would want to impress. And they all know, everybody in India knows that Gandhi drank his own piss, but nobody in, in the Western world knows that. So they come terribly embarrassed if, if you bring up the fact that, and so they would make all these excuses for drinking. I mean, what kind of excuse can you make for drinking your own piss? They have to say, yes, Ayurvedic medicine and body blah. I'll tell, I'll tell you, it's not, the, the drinking your own piss thing is, is, is very old in Asia. Is basically they know about testosterone because uh, in ancient China, people would go around with a big piss bucket and they would get um, everybody, you know, the male, males to piss in the big bucket. They would boil all the, all the urine away till there was just crystalline uh, substance left. That crystalline sub substance is actually um, steroids. It's basically testosterone. And so that, that's the reason why we know about things. So, but then that, that would be a Chinese herbal cure. So so anyway, it's it's legit science. The Chinese have been doing this for thousands of years. And, and HRT, H HRT the, the substitute hormones for the menopause that's given to women, it's made in labs from the urine of mares. Uh, of, yeah. Uh, so, and, and there's a medication that's given to women called Premarin, very yes. primarin because it's in it it says it's coming from a mare it's the it's the urine of a of a of a mare that's transformed and given to humans for as a substitute for their own uh it's it works that way well it's a bit more complicated but it works that way you're right but, but, but hr hrt patients can uh what they excrete is exactly the same as the mare right uh yeah well um uh, yeah, because it, they increase. There's a sort. There's a sort of. Yeah, it's it's. That's why I say it's a bit more complicated than that. But um, the pregnant mare, the the mare that are that are, they have enormous amounts of certain things, and then they give it to the menopause women who don't have. It, if you want to make it a bit more, yeah. So, so this is all of good science. I'll, I'll give you one more example. That there's um, uh, particularly in um, uh, LSD, lysergic uh acid and stuff like that that all goes straight through you so you can, yeah. you can recycle lsd as much as you want and psilocybin and a lot of these these psychotropic drugs so so here's something which is a bit of esoterica you might find interesting is that magic mushroom psilocybin uh was used by shamans for tens of thousands of years you know basically they know that in siberia and stuff the shamans were using uh magic mushrooms now Here's the esoterica, is uh, reindeer adore magic mushrooms because it makes them high. So what they would do is they would, they would follow reindeer into the forest. The reindeer are very good at sniffing. They're almost like truffle pigs sniffing out <laughs> magic mushrooms. The reindeer eat the magic mushrooms, get, get high on the psy psilocybin and start staggering around and then basically fall over. What the shamans and uh, a lot of the tribes in the Tega used to do is, is go and milk the urine out of, um, out of the, um, the reindeer. And that's, uh, that, that was considered like the, well, they've done experiments. It's very, very pure psilocybin. It's a great source of psilocybin and it doesn't get, have all the, the nasty things, coallogens and stuff that gives you uh, an after effect and hangover kind of thing from taking it. So that, that was the primary source of the magic mushrooms and all these ceremonies was reindeer piss. And so, so anyway, the whole thing is uh, if you, if you, you know, recycling all these uh, medications is religious science. Anyway, it was a nice excursion, but the point is that I would just say, even if we never had this machine that actually does it, we pretend we do, we advertise it, even if it's a joke kind of thing. And the, the other kind of products I was, th I was thinking is, I'm giving you this as an idea for controversial, edgy, politically provocative kind of things. The other thing I think is like, you just give people little vials of things, basically call it like bad guy DNA. And it's like 100% certified to be synthesized like, you know, Osama bin Laden, Gaddafi, um, Saddam Hussein's DNA is, you know, basically in this little tube that you can buy. And what you do is you stick it down your toilet 
and you freak out the NSA <laughs> surveillance that's downstream in the sewage. I don't know if people know this, but in uh, in America, and I think in, my, in probably the UK and stuff, but a lot of the surveillance is done on your sewage because they, they're looking for people making bombs and doing meth labs and stuff. And so they, uh, and actually COVID tracking is done through sewage. Basically, they do a lot of e epidemiology um, uh, tracking. They keep it all secret because they don't want you to know <laughs> and stop shoving shit down. But that's how they know that uh, people are, are doing so. They assume you'll flush some stuff that they can detect uh, somewhere down the, the pre treatment plants. I know all this because I've I've worked on the sensor stuff for governments. <laughs> sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I just saw a message coming up from uh, there on the side, and they, they, you say uh, S S J. You say uh, update on Kevin. He went idle on this call, so he's probably went to bed. So I just uh, we'd see what we do with that. Uh, there you go. Ah, too bad. Well, hopefully we hopefully we can get them again. Let's let's maybe try again. Yeah. Oh, you're on mute. Or we could arrange our questions on the subject. Maybe uh, we can see later on if we. But we have enough to talk yeah. about. Yeah, have two two questions he sent me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so anyway, the you know I'm just saying these are the type of products you could do. Is they they kind of edgy joke products that are almost like uh, too good to be true kind of things. Um, but generally getting people to think, making them a bit paranoid, making them distrust the state, you know, it's, it's um, just basically things to, to wake people up. But they may be legit. They may be things that we actually go and do. Um, like I, like the, the Faraday, the Faraday case and stuff like that is, it's very good thing to do to make people. It it really designed to make people think, make people question. You know their use of digital technology to 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 be provocative and make people say outraged that you might, you know, destroy their cell phone and stuff like. That. You don't actually have to, you know, do EMP devices uh, to destroy people's cell phones, but if you if you if you offered them for sale, even as a joke, um, uh, you know that's um, that's the kind of thing I'm thinking. If if we did all this kind of thing, uh, in general, you you might do something like not actually send. You know, maybe the products don't actually exist. All this kind of product I'm talking about. But if somebody was fool enough to send you some geodo and order a product like this, then what we do is we send them something which is um, a starter pack on a, a trailhead that's uh, you know takes them down a rabbit hole. So yeah, uh, you get the idea. Are you, are you getting the general idea of, of what I'm talking about? How how you would use these uh, these geodo to keep the game running? Um, but it means that. You have to operate the game, you know, as a business, grow it organically. Every everybody participates and helps out doing this kind of stuff. Um, but it's it's a lot of it's just pure hokum and theater. Um, but in it, you might find that there is something that somebody wants. You might hit on something that's a complete wacky idea that people do actually want then you would have to basically start taking it seriously and make a business out of it and actually start providing the product and doing support for the product and doing a bit of R&D. So you might get sucked into one of these things. That's the danger of doing these things is they might they sometimes turn real. <laughs> In fact, they often turn real. And so so that's the, the general idea. Is anybody freaked out? What's the... Temperature level here <laughs> for people. Um, I think the only thing I could think of is: um, Are there any like laws or things that we have to be aware of? Um, you know, depending on the country we're in, or is that something we need to look into? Laws yeah, and regulations. Yeah, you yeah. you would. Yeah, the idea is to stay on the right side of the law, but go right to the edge. You see a lot of. A lot of this stuff is um, 
you know, you, you really want to not be a goody two shoes. You want to challenge the law itself. What I mean by that is take is challenge it in every way. Am I, so you should imagine having to stand up on the stand and defend your actions, right? In a in a court. You may have to, it's quite possible. And at some stage that so, you might wind up in a court defending your actions. Now, in 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 that case, uh, you want to challenge the whole basis of our society and our law and stuff. So so the kind of thing I'm talking about is a you're offering a joke product for a fake currency. Um, all of this is is defensible. You have to you would have to think this through when you do each of these things. But the idea is not to make sure oh that we're covered legally. It's to be provocative legally. So in other words, uh, you know, like XR and Roger Hallam and stuff, they're doing civil disobedience in a kind of gross way, just, you know, gross and stupid way, I would say. It's just go, you know, sit on the street corner, get arrested. It's bloody predictable. You're going to be fined 10,000 pounds, as they have been for organizing um, organizing resistance in Britain. Well, that's what this type is going to do is going to just it's easy for them. They just chuck, you know, chuck a 10 grand fine and you are screwed. So they're not getting anywhere. They're just undermining themselves. But what in principle, although Roger Hahn's a bit of a rube and he doesn't really, he's not, he's not very clued up individual. He's, he's good at organizing stuff and he's very, very dedicated. He is the gold standard for authenticity just not very smart. If he's smarter, he would wind up in court and fuck the court up. Because if you if you get into court and they they throw everything at you, and this is very novel, you set precedents, you do new tactics and stuff that they've never seen before. And they're basically, if you get dismissed, they are fucked. They're seriously fucked. Because basically, the, they, you've just cut a big swathe through, through the law that basically they will take a long time to, to patch up again. So as long as you're innovating and coming up with new shit, that basically the, the, the way you must think about it is a, a, imagine a prosecuting attorney thinking, what the fuck is this? Is these guys, is this real? Is this a game? Is this a real currency? Was this real fraud? Was it a joke? Is it theater? It's you must completely throw dirt in the eye so that they don't know where free speech ends, where a big con starts, where activism and lone wolf activity is it must be complete FUD. And, and that's where we we need to be in terms of resistance. Resistance these days needs to be really seriously sophisticated. It needs to be like this. And so basically you have to be super clever and basically really fuck with the system. And, that, and that's that's really what you're doing is, is stirring the pot. But you can't do traditional old bullshit like Gandhi did because that's all has been stuff. And they've uh, prepared the ground for it. They basically, they, they've they seen you coming 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And so this is all new stuff that people don't know, like ARGs and stuff. It's There's no precedent in law for this kind of thing. So you really push it. Yeah, you've got to be brave because it might backfire on you and you do 10 years in jail, but I'm, I'm prepared to. What the fuck? It's, it's like I, I would do 10 years in jail if it all went wrong. Uh, yeah, I don't mind seeing the apocalypse out in jail if, if it, comes, it comes down to it because you've, you've got to you know, resist. It, it could be a lot worse if you don't. Roger Hallam is absolutely right on that. He's got the, the lay of the land. But yeah, yeah, it just XR is just completely clueless about where 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 we're at in terms of you know how things have developed in the world. But so anyway, that that's my my thinking on it is is that it's uh, it's provocative. It's it's raising people's awareness and uh, yeah. So that, that's that. Uh, I'll let people talk a bit and then I'll say some more. <coughs> I have uh, just something to say because I've been messaging there and um, uh, there was a question. I'm sorry, I'm a bit out of the subject and just be very brief. But um, 
uh, what you say, um, Kevin is uh, in Japan and he's asleep. So uh, you're saying, uh, do you want to come on and say what you wanted to say? Can you put on your microphone so it's easier because I'm reading the messages. Um, I'm saying that you can see them all. Uh, there was an offer to, to make the meeting earlier so he could join because he's in Japan. But uh, there's some people in the US uh, on the group and it might be for you very early if we do it two hours earlier. I don't know. I don't um, mind. Actually. Yeah, because we could do a, a, a one-off uh, meeting just on that subject of the prions and the and bioweapons and mRNA, all the all of the vaccines. Could, could we do it during the week? Just to uh, an extra one. Maybe maybe we could do just a me an extra meeting in the week for that. Yeah. Well, I suppose we could contact Kevin by his uh, server or his uh, his um, messaging and ask him for that. We could see that. Okay. So just I just was reading. Yeah messages i didn't want them to become too too do, big do, do you mind handling that and just I, i'll do any old time yeah, this, uh, this member uh severe jury eight do you want to can you turn on your microphone because you seem to be clued in to to kevin's whereabouts and work and you you're posting some links there on um i see uh, so i don't know i'm happy to to liaise too i'm ha very happy to to liaise but we can we can work out something maybe in the week for uh, any other members um, there who would like to say something about this? Hello? Yeah, go yeah, ahead. This is a severe jury. <laughs> um, yeah, so he's in uh, Japan, and uh, this is a little bit late for him. He usually is, uh, this is like what, like 2.30 a.m. in uh, Japan? So I'm sure that we could get him on earlier if we started like two to three hours um, earlier. Yeah, I think that would work pretty well. Can we do it in the week before next Sunday? Well, he's retired, so I'm sure, yeah, he, he probably has time for that, yeah. Yeah, so I'm in Greece. So I, I five hours behind, something like that. So I, I'm happy to, to go, you know, any time earlier. Yeah, I'm in Ireland, so I'm the same. I'm only two hours difference with Greece. I don't mind. Any time suits me. I'm, I'm okay. Yeah, um, you can go ahead and ask him. I might be at work, but uh, I'll ask Sophie to kind of record if I'm not available but um, during the week. But, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll message him. I, I messaged him earlier in the week. I gave him the time, but... Yeah, I don't know. I guess there was some misunderstanding there, I guess. No problem. It's a yeah, I'm delighted to have him on. So if we can we can do it anytime during the week, it'd be great. Yeah. I uh you you could I mean I sent some some good links uh in the chat that you could it, like they're pretty short. I mean I don't know what you what you're planning on, but um I mean, you could like read the introduction. I, I mean, it's up to you, but it's a pretty short thing. Or do you want to just wait until we get Kevin? I would love to to speak to him. And oh right, yeah, so I'll just continue my conversation with him. I, I messaged him on Discord, so uh, he just is okay. not answering right now. So I'll continue. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Let, us, let us know on XRMed or Discord. Where, I, I'm flexible on the time. I'll do. Oh, great. Okay. So uh, yeah. So back to the the topics then. In, in terms of what Gary's talking about, you know, doing like uh, a regular. Monetizing it like a regular cult. So, yeah, uh, you got to be really, really careful here because the the danger is that uh, you perceived to be doing this for the money. The the thing is that basically the world is structured so you need money to do bloody anything. Um, you can't, but people will resent you for collecting money. Um, and the, the accusation is you're just doing this project for the money. 
I certainly am not doing this project for the money, but uh, you know, you reasonably to actually devote time to it. You know, nobody's time is free, uh, really. And so, yeah, people deserve compensation for the time they put in, just by the rules of our society and culture. But um, and practically speaking, but uh, if you if you known if this whole thing is known for being primarily as a money making scheme, then um, it's it's dead in the water. Now it's dangerous because it can become that way. If it, if it takes off and it is a success, um, this has been the death of me in in all the projects I've done. Is is everybody involved forgets the train we came in on. They forget the purity of the activism and all the noble ideals, and they start to see dollar signs in their eyes, and um, then it all goes south. Uh, that's happened to me in everything I've ever done, uh, basically. <laughs> made a success out of it, being torn apart by people that just were really greedy, and they, you know, they, they were, you know, they were fine until there was serious money and prospects on the table. And then it turns into a fucking feeding frenzy. Um, so you, it's it's very what I'm the picture I'm painting here is very dangerous to start monetizing it um, because it's pretty much the seeds of its own destruction. It's very hard to manage. Money is the root of all evil, and money makes everything go bad. Uh, but alternatively, you can't get anywhere in our society without it. So you, you have to ride this tiger and uh, do it. So I think it's time to start doing it and start monetizing it, but I'm saying that I'm doing it with a very heavy heart. It's basically the end. The, the other thing is if it uh, takes off. So this this kind of thing works until it gets visibility. If as soon as, as, soon as it gets visibility, and if it got press coverage in that, that's kind of the end of you as well. There's very few people can survive the, the whirlwind of um, of popularity and press coverage. Um, and if, if it becomes popular, the, it's a whole new dynamic. The people that will come in are just fuckheads, to put it mildly. Um, the, the forces and the dynamics involved, if it becomes a success and if it gets over... If it gets over a few thousand people, uh, that's you're in trauma territory. So it's it, it's so as long as everybody knows that's what happens, then I say we should go go ahead and do it. I will I will tell you now that my expectation is it would turn into a fucking train wreck, but that's human nature. And then what you have to say is, well, that was the destiny of this project and this cult was to be, you know, you can only do as much as you can do. And if uh, it, that would be the destiny of the cult. It would wake people up as far as it does <clears throat> and become a train wreck and say, well, that was what it was meant to be. <laughs> and you just live with it. Yeah, but it's sad. That's the way the world wow. works. But that is yeah, the way the world works. I know what you're saying. I understand very well what you're saying. But if we go back to why Gary suggested that, um, I think it was, or, oh, I don't know about the others here, but I'm I'm living very modestly on a on a little self, nearly self sufficient way. Well, not really, but nearly. You uh, probably, Hugh, you're nearly in the same situation. Mike has a job. I don't know about the others, but the idea for Gary was to to enable you and maybe us, but you specifically to continue your work without having to return to a, a paid job and then. You know, because you've you've produced and, and given a lot of time and good content to and research and enormous amount of quality videos. And I think from him's point of view, he didn't want to see you having to 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 you know to go back to, to the to the grind and, 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 and see. So it was coming. So if we set some targets, modest targets and honest about what we want to achieve with generating money we're not talking about we're not talking about profit we're not talking about thousands we're not we're talking about something that enables a few to continue or you especially but maybe some 
you were saying it would be better as a group to generate for everyone. But I think Gary was centered mostly on you in this uh, in this situation at the moment. I know things can change all the time. I know this is volatile. We all would like to spend more time at this. And I mean, it's it's fun and it's happiness. It's great. But uh, it was that was I think that was the beginning point, and I don't think we need to set our targets that high and start to drag thousands of people. And start, that's that's completely ridiculous. But I think I, I'm not a figure person. I'm hopeless, hopeless with money and and calculations and everything. I'm I'm the worst person in the world to advise on business and stuff like that. But what I gather is, why don't we set a target and see what we can do within within that sort of modest um, limit. Yeah, I don't like the idea of setting targets because that's, you, you basically you go for that uh, deadline and it becomes, it becomes a focus on its own. It's not a good idea to, but it's, it's not, you know, it's not basically Kairos, it's Kronos. So, so yeah, I, I uh, instinctively recoil from, setting deadlines and targets. That's uh, the very thing that we try to work against. Uh, but uh, yeah, but uh, so yeah, in terms of what's, uh, what's practically needed, it's not all that much. In fact, uh, a, a reasonable YouTube channel that got conventional revenue um, you know, basically 10,000 subscriptions or something like that, you basically you could live on. Well, I could live on. Uh, the the problem is that to do that kind of video, you have to you have to that kind of channel, you have to do a popular channel, and that's kind of like you know just have a think or philosophy tube or something like that. It's basically popular shit that people want to hear. You may you basically give people what they want, and then they feel good, and then they pay you back, and you're basically a drug dealer because you give them endorphins, and they pay you back. Thanks for giving me endorphins. I'm not a drug dealer. I'm trying to wake people up and get them off drugs. So that's a hard sell. Nobody wants the truth. Nobody wants to get off the drugs. Yeah, yeah. So, I see. so it's difficult yeah. to make money. So so yeah, if if I just wanted to make money, I, I know how to make popular videos about hoorah, this is tech, you know, look at this tech solution. Yeah, look, solar panels are getting more wonderful. You'll have fit thousand people <laughs> subscribing to you oh i feel so good about this how the planet's going downhill now it's not what i want to do i want to basically say my stick is we're fucked and what i offer you is basically what i the the one thing i offer is pretty unique is like you're on the fucking fight titanic this thing is going down there's no saving it and i'll i will make the time you have left worthwhile now, it's, there are not many people in that market because most people don't think the Titanic's going down. <laughs> and even if they do, they want to be dragged out. What, what I'm doing is giving you the best trip you can have on the Titanic as it goes, as it sinks. Most people say, just lobotomize me, drug me, so I don't feel any pain as I go through this. I say, no, <laughs> that's what everybody else is offering. What I'm offering you is realization. I say, you can wake up, you can see the peak moments of the basically, you, you can actually live an examined life. You can actually get a peak of a human experience. I can take you there. You ain't gonna, it's, it's no pleasure trip. <laughs> And very, very few people are actually would give money for this, but there are some. And so, so, but yeah, what I would start doing now is doing videos and stuff that I would do, as Gary says, you basically, you put paywalls and you, you rank people. Um, it's basically going through the layered brain. So well, the way a cult works is they play off each one of your layers and I can, we could devote a long, long time to all of describe in detail if anybody wants to. It's kind of dangerous because people might misuse it. But it, uh, uh, one they uh, cults often use is take, for instance, the, the primate brain. So people love ranking and ordering and badging and stuff. So uh, the way um, the way things like the solar temple cult worked 
um, and uh, Freemasonry, all of these guys, is they they have a kind of a freemium model, and then they have um, an inner circle. So you have all these rings and circles. People will will fucking sell their fucking kids to move up a rung in some kind of hierarchy. It's built into our primate brains. So you just, you know, Napoleon said, uh, he says, give me enough ribbon and I'll conquer the world. What, what he meant was the ribbon for medals. Because if you've ever been in the military, you get girls by having medals. You get status, you know, guys respect you. The, the eyes goggle, the, the primate brain and puts you up on a pedestal. And all you have to do is have little ribbons with little, little fucking tokens on. And basically you can be idiot men. You can have wall to wall fucking medals on your chest and people will go, Oh, and Napoleon didn't knew saw through the game. He thought this is a fucking piece of ribbon and a bit of fucking tin. And these cunts will fucking die for it. They'll run at cannons for it. He thought, if you're that fucking stupid, give me enough ribbon, I'll conquer the world. And he did. He Napoleon didn't have a fucking single ribbon on him. He gave them to other cunts who were stupid enough to run at fucking grape shot. And that, so, so real psychopaths know that people are fucking stupid and primitive and primates. And so they will do ranking and, and gating. So basically, if you do ranking and gating, it's very easy. You say, you know, you have to do these achievement levels. Basically, guys who do in the gaming industry, they they are we talking in computer games? They do this. They basically do banking, uh, badging. So badging as well. They do, they, you know, they do this in the Boy Scouts and stuff. Is uh, like you have to go through this obstacle and you get this little badge, and you're like. I can buy my own badge. Those badges cost a dollar. I say like, oh, no, no, it wouldn't be a legitimate badge. It's like, yeah, really? So I go through a load of shit. You give me a dollar badge, and then it's legitimate? Why don't I go down to the store, just buy a fucking badge for a dollar? Why is that not legitimate? Oh, you didn't go through the obstacles. <laughs> oh, fuck your obstacles. Uh, you see, but if you set up this grade of initiation and this ranking, People will go nuts to together. It's a very dangerous thing. The military thrives on it. Corporations thrive on it. And then, then there are other dynamics in it. As soon as people, uh, as soon as you get a sucker that for, that goes for this game, complete moron, obviously. But what they show is that they two things that that a they liars. They will put on a mask to basically get forward in the rank and basically they will play the game uh, so they they expose themselves as frauds and the other thing is they they expose themselves as immoral and because what they they're saying is i will beat the bastards under me, underneath me so this is why it's powerful is is a you have the guy complicit he's kind of he's or he's compromised morally from his primate brain he's been a weasel and he knows it so he basically, he, you have him from the point of view as you both have a secret that you're a cunt and I know it and you know it. So that's what the boss gets to do. And that's their little secret. So they have this little bond. And then the other part of this dreadful bargain is that you say like, now that we have this little twist between you and me, here's a fucking button. Go and beat those other bastards that don't play the game. And so you have this capo system. It's called a capo system. And you get these bastards then that will beat downwards. And then you can make a little hierarchy of them. And this is how 8 million Jews went to their death in Germany. It was prisoner self-administration. The Nazis realized that this is the way you manage 8 million people, all the way to the gas chambers. And the lesson that the Allies took after the war they adopted it. They, they admired the Nazis. They narrowly defeated the, the Nazis. And they, they came so close. I mean, Germany was one country stood on its own against the world. It impressed the rest of the world. What America and the Allies did was they didn't go, oh, that's nasty. They told the children that. They said, oh, no, you know, Nazism is really nasty. Good thing we got rid of that. 
That's what they told the children. What they did was, that's fucking awesome. How do we get a slice of that? And then they did stuff like Operation Paperclip. They got all the Nazi. They took the Nazi research. They got. They looked and examined how it was done, and then they exported it and perfected it in the Western society, in liberal Western society. If you don't believe me or know what I'm talking about here, go and you know do some research on Adam Curtis and on things like Eddie Bernays and how this was very consciously done. So, so in other words, <clears throat> this is the global cult. And so it's what they're doing is replicating standard cult practice that goes back all the way to Gobekli Tepe and Ur and the first civilizations. And, and that's how they pray. So, so Gary's t saying what's what you have to do so that I'm giving you the complete raw thing of what, what it means to actually do a hierarchy. And that's what cults are doing. We all in cults, right? The mainstream. The entire industrial civilization is our snuff cult, our collective 7.8 million member snuff cult. So what we're offering here is like, guys, this is a cult, but this is a cult that will get you out of cults. It'll let you see through cults. If you can get through this cult, you basically will be free of cults. Now, that's not an offer that's often put on the table. But uh, so that, that's that's the ranking. That's how how ranking works and exclusivity and those kind of uh, rings. But I I will start doing a little bit. I'll start doing things like I'll start doing videos. I think which I put um, you know behind paywalls and stuff and get people to do. But uh, in terms of if we if I get Geodo going again and get an exchange, um, you know. A coin exchange or something like that uh, to make it, you know, compatible with gold or exchangeable for gold or backed by gold. Then, uh, you know, we can start doing that kind of thing, and you make rings of exclusivity. But I'm telling you all this here because none of us must have any illusions about what the fuck we're doing. It's evil. It's pure evil. But for, you know. It's basically, it's only evil if you, you know, if your intent is to exploit it. And that's what the guys on the top are doing. So it ha it, it's also a Ponzi scheme, is that basically what people in the inner circle are doing is they're living off new recruits. So the new recruits are shortchanged. It's, it's, but that's our entire society. America, the whole American experiment is built on... Uh, immigration and immigration is a story of you have the original settlers though the insiders those are the top of the hierarchy and then each wave of immigrants that comes in are the new recruits into the ponzi scheme they at the bottom of the barrel they're the initiates they're the ones that get hazed and exploited and the whole system builds on this waves of exploited immigration and that's that's how how everything works that's how our generational scheme works is the young people are suckered in, made to work uh, so that old people can retire on the stock exchange. It's, it's fucked up beyond belief, but that's the, this is the system we live in. And what it forces us to do is to do a successful counter movement against it is you have to basically, you know, do exactly what they do in Rome. You're in Rome, you have to do what the Romans do. And this is what the Romans do. The Romans are cunts. <laughs> but the way to fight them is to beat them at their own game. And this is it. What, what's happened to me in the past is that I've always done this. Beat the Romans at their own game. And then all the guys that, that I've done it with have, have done me in because they become Roman. You can't... Basically, the way it works is you can... You can get the slaves out of the plantation, but you can't get the fucking plantation out of the slaves. So if we do this and monetize all this stuff, it's co-committant, the responsibility is on us to make sure we balance it with getting this, this toxin, the slave system, out of the people that are in the game and the cult as we get build the cult. And that's something I would, I would like to, to belong to and I'd like to do. But that's something very difficult. It's extremely difficult, yeah.
-hmm. Yeah, I, I expressed this. Huh? I mean, do you know, uh, difficulty. Um, I mean, if that's the only uh, cautious, being cautious and knowing that we're going into difficulty will make us build some safeguards and maybe some uh, strong uh, evalu auto evaluation and, and exchange and and we need to stay cohesive and you know i don't know it's a, it's a new uh, vigilant we explore vigilant yeah very basically the, the antidote is to tell the truth to courageously to tell the truth yeah to to ourselves so if anybody sees us going wrong they got to speak up i'm i'm kind of um simplistic and uh, I was thinking more of what my skills are that I could offer um, and I was thinking more of um, like physical joke products like you know you had an article about lobotomy like we could have a lobotomy cap you know I I know how to knit so you know uh, so you know just joke products like that so that's perfect um, yeah <laughs> I mean, or, so I can help you. Or yeah, or like a like an anarchy pin. Like I can make a letter A. But these are just small things I can make. I'm I'm not so intellectually uh, sophisticated. But you know, just I can make little joke products. I I see on YouTube that some channels they have a like a box. Like if you become a member of the the channel or if you subscribe, then you get a box. So. You could have a box, say, of a copy of your book and a little decoder ring that has a trailblazer thing or a, what do you call it? A trailhead to the yeah, art. Yeah. You know, just little little doodads that are simple and inexpensive or, um, you know, uh, anti-lobotomy cap, whatever. Uh, <laughs> so so my, skills are more, my, my skills are more tangible rather than... Um, you know, designing intellectual things. So, have you seen the Institute uh, movie, the documentary from 2011? No, I have not. I've wanted to. I know you you mentioned that a long time ago. Yeah. So, if you have a look at that, uh, be careful because the other there's another Institute movie that was I think from 2017. It's not that one. Uh, this one's from 2011, and it's the AMC Dispatches from Elsewhere was a spin-off from that 2011. The the guy that did Dispatches from Elsewhere, I can't remember what his name is, but he was Im as impressed with uh, that Institute movie as I was. Um, also, that um, Douglas Adams movie, The Game, was also somebody who was as impressed by that um, that thing. But anyway, if you go and look at the Institute movie and make sure it's the 2011 version, you'll see all some of the, the stuff that they did. It's, it's all lovely, lovely stuff. Uh, it, it's very simple, crafty, and imaginative. Uh, for example, one of the things they did was uh, they had a location point that you you had to get to in one of the trails, and they just had a little card uh, it was of the the San Francisco skyline. It was a print of the San Francisco skyline, and then had a cutout, just a circle. So you had to go around San Francisco and hold it up and see. Only when you're standing in exactly the right spot would the skyline look right, and so. It's all that perfect kind of stuff, you know. Basically, you, they have uh, you know maps and sheets, and if you if you fold over four ways, they make a whole new map. So that you have a, like a crap map, a tourist map on the front, but if you if you fold it over, you know maps on both sides. But if you fold them over in four corners, then it makes a new map that has a whole lot of uh, you know there's another thing like that. So it's it's all those kind of things that particularly have dual uses and people have to think about and stuff. So it's it's basically stuff that that engages people um but it's 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 limitless what what you can do. They had stuff where people would go to a certain site um uh just a geolocation and then you know, they would set up this thing like a dance party. <laughs> they make people go to a phone and they would have, you know, 
just engage them in a crap phone conversation. Any, you see, what you're doing is you're really breaking people's boundaries and and breaking people's perceptions and um, absurdism and all that kind of thing. So it's really a question of sitting down and thinking up something really hilarious or absurd. Um, and so, yeah, it's, um, you know, people live a very gray um, existence. <laughs> and yeah, if you give them, it, it's such a, it's such a gift to give them a little ray of light. You see, everybody feels that they're going to get a call from God one day and say, your number's been called, you know, like, I'm going to elevate you out of the shithole. <laughs> Everybody's waiting for that fucking phone call that never comes. And it's never going to come. They're all going to die. But you you have to imagine that you just give them the gift of that phone call from God. <laughs> it says, like, hello? Uh, there's been a mistake. You weren't supposed to go down to earth and suffer and have a shit life and live a gray, boring existence. Um, we're going to correct that. Uh, you'll be seeing a spaceship coming down shortly. Are you, are you ready? Everybody's waiting for that call. This, you know, the lottery win. This basically somewhere somebody will tap them on the shoulder and take them out of this misery. You know, and that that's that's part of slave culture is is waiting for this deliverance. And so you just basically there are a couple of things here one of them is you give them that deliverance but truthfully it's fake because we're not going to deliver them to the planets you know to the pleiades or the planet sirius or the planet elsewhere or any we're not going to deliver them i mean i don't know about you but i don't have a spaceship to take people to the planet elsewhere otherwise i'd be elon musk and do it but if you give them that, if you, you see, it's hard to describe psychology. If you give them that, say, here, this is what you want. Give it to them. It kind of satisfies that, although they know it's bullshit, it satisfies that yearning and breaks it. It snaps them out of that yearning. They know that what you've given them is bullshit. You know, you give them a golden ticket. You give them the Willy Wonka golden ticket. You say, there, you've got it. I've given you. And it's and you say, you know, you know, and I know it's fake. We're never going to get out of that. But it is liberation nonetheless. Really hard to see, but it's, it's solid gold psychologically. You see, people don't really need to be physically taken out and delivered like they think. You could just do ritualize it. It could be done as mockery, almost like a religious rite. Yeah, see, millions of people all over the world are baptized and into this fucking bullshit religion, told there's an imaginary friend in the sky, and now they're saved. They know it's bullshit. The Christians that do it know it's bullshit. It doesn't really matter. Psychologically speaking, it's... Uh, they are actually released in a funny way. But you see, wh where the Christians are going wrong is that they maintain, they pretend it's not bullshit. That's where they're going wrong. You see, what, the, what Christians should be doing, and I might say this in my next Christian bashing videos, is what they should be doing is saying like, uh, you know, we're going to baptize you, here you saved, here have the communion, and say, uh, by the way, you know, it's all bullshit. There's no one up in the sky. There is no God. You do know that. Okay, we're just checking. Um, just full disclosure, this is bullshit. Anyway, let's go on with the communion. You know, you see, if they did that, if the Pope said, you know, God doesn't actually exist. It's just bullshit. And I'm, I'm just an ordinary guy. But anyway, as long as we're clear on that point, let's go on. This Christian thing is fun. It wouldn't detract anything from Christianity. You see, the Pope and all these frauds, they actually believe that, it, oh, that'll be the end of the Christian of Catholic Church. No, it wouldn't. In fact, it would probably be the making of the Christian Church. They would just come honestly and say the truth, that there is no God. But they could carry on doing all the shit they're doing because it doesn't really matter. And this is the reason why. Our alien cortex wants 
it wants to believe in all this bullshit like God and Christ and Buddha and all this complete bullshit nonsense. Solar panels and, you know, technological singularities and we're all going to live on a Mars. It's our nutty, fucked up alien cortex that believes all of this stuff. But it's easily bought off. You just say, you know, here it is. Um, you know, there, you've got your wish. And you say, like, well, I know it's a lie. You know it's a lie. We're clear on that. But it is actually fulfilled. Does that make sense to anybody? There's a story about the, the princess who wanted the moon. And they said to her, like, yeah, it's, you can't have the moon. It's like no one knows how to get it out. And basically she got sicker and sicker. The king didn't know what to do about it. And eventually they got the, you know, kind of a trickster, uh, like the, the court jester, uh, I think, was how the story goes. And he said to her, like, uh, here, he says, okay, I'll give you the moon. So it's like, uh, you know, uh, how do you want me to get it down? He said, well, it shouldn't be too much trouble. If I hold my thumb up next to it, it's about the size of my fingernail. It shouldn't be too. So he went and got a little silver ball the size of the moon and said, here, I got it for you. She said, oh, thanks. And he says, but, but the moon's still up there. He says, yeah, it gets replaced every night. If you take it down, another one replaces it. And she was cured. <laughs> so the thing is, you can be a Christian. You can behave like a Christian and know absolutely that it's all bullshit. It doesn't matter. Whatever Christianity does for you, it would do, even if you're honest and say that there is no God. You could still go to church saying, yeah, I know this is all bullshit, but still. Fucking dig it. <laughs> right. And uh, that, that would save everybody. Yeah. And uh, like you said, those places have that satwa and, you know, just being there and imbibing the incense, the silence, the statues from medieval times. Um, that is an effect on us. Yeah. Yeah. That, you see, that's real freedom. See, a lot of people are anti-religion, a lot of anarchists and stuff are anti-religion and anti, anti the church, and they think, but it's a lie. There is no God up there. You should be atheist. You say, yeah, I know it's all a lie, but like, yeah, I, you forbid yourself from going in a church. I go in a church to go like, yeah, this is all horseshit, but it's nice. <laughs> then you're really free. Then you're really, really, really free of Christianity. See, in a way, anarchists and atheists are not free because they're in opposition to religion. They're not really free of it. Anyway, that's the lesson for today. <laughs> Maybe we should end it there. These religions, all these, all these religions, they just they make they make people feel better about themselves. That's what. But but that is okay, right? As as long right. as they're honest and they say, you know, this is all bullshit. It's just to make you feel better. So, Okay, well, at least we're clear on that point. Thanks for the, <laughs> the thanks for the communion wine. It yeah. completely nullifies it. It, it becomes uh, evil because people say it's they lie. They say it's not what it is. Yeah, I just wanted to say I I spent some time, uh, you know, as an atheist trying to convince Christians that you know give them all the reasons the Bible contradicts itself, and it seems like they. It, they still believe and even if they know it's a lie i think i see what you're saying it's they'll still believe and in a way being an an anti-religious atheist person could become its own religion as well which i noticed yeah yeah that that's the problem that that's the problem it it, it basically re religion is 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 the trap so getting anti-religion can become its own trap it's very subtle to get out of to be completely free of it. When I was in my 40s, I, I joined the local uh, Church of Ireland, which is Protestant uh, in Ireland, uh, going because I was bringing some people in there because they were refugees, whatever. I found myself in the middle of that little church. And I liked it because there was beautiful singing and the place was beautiful in the middle of a nice lawn with flowers. And I got into the habit of going there, where, even though I don't believe in anything, but and actually, it's true. Once you are um, free uh, inside, you can really enjoy uh, the, the the getting together. And and I discovered after that that the the reverend who was looking after the Church of Ireland one day was at 
visiting in the hospital at the same time as me, some dying person. And uh, the dying person was talking with him and I was there because I was the doctor there. And he was saying, you know, and I, I'm, I'm afraid that I'm going to face God. <laughs> and the reverend said to him, oh, you know, I wouldn't make too much, too much of that God thing, you know, don't worry about that. And I thought, oh, <laughs> I picked the right place to go. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I know. I know. And it was a, quite a small community, you know, minority. And I thought, wow, <laughs> I don't go there anymore because he's gone. But it was great at the time. <laughs> yeah, but isn't that the solution to all of this I know. stuff? I know. <laughs> and the person on the bed was all peaceful, you know. Oh, and if he says that, like, oh, I shouldn't be afraid. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You see, if if you say like you know all the, the god stuff is bullshit you know but like yeah. but you you okay with it it's like oh is, it doesn't mean that yeah. that's the end of the world nah yeah. it's like, oh okay well that's reassuring yeah, i thought we, god didn't exist that was the end of the world nice oh, exist. you know you can <laughs> yeah, it's okay it's okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, but, but think how different it is in the rest of the world where it's like we, we've got to fight Islamic fundamentalism and all these jihadists and we've got to, like, you know, use killer drones against them. And you're like, you do know you're fucking barking mad. He's <laughs> like, no, no, I'm against jihadis. You know, it's like, think of 9 11. We've got to do something. It's like, hey, all these bastard liberals were saying the same thing after the Capitol uh, riots. It's like, these, this is a cult. QAnon is a cult. How can we deprogram these people? How, you know, how can we get more, you know, psychotherapists and professionals out there to get rid of this mental toxin and stuff and say, uh, okay. We'll get to them later. Let's start with you, fuckhead, because <laughs> you got a bigger problem. You, Mr. Liberal, have a way bigger problem than that guy that went to you know, and raided the capital. But they can't see it. They can't see it. It's like they, I haven't got a problem. I'm I'm normal. I'm like everybody else. Really? Like this fucking snuff cult that's basically wiping out the planet? You're normal. <laughs> so yeah, that's. That's kind of the, the first step to mental health, but no, no one wants mental health. <laughs> Not when there's insanity and money to be had. <laughs> but yeah. So anyway, well, that, well, that's cool. So we've got a little bit further, further down the track. <laughs> yeah. All right. Should we wrap it up then? Um, yeah. yeah. Well, before we wrap it up. Can we decide what we do for Kevin because, or who is going to, because is he going, are we going to make a meeting in the week or are we going to do the Sunday one earlier? I what? think SJ is going to make one in the week. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully. Okay. That's grand with me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Maybe we should just, uh, if there's some people who are stuck, who can't do it on certain days or just get in touch with, you know, with each other because... I don't know. Some people might be working. And... Oh, did you get, did you have um, a preferred time, Hugh and Sophie? I think um, I don't mind. I'm really flexible. What, what, what got, uh, not Thursday evening. Oh. That's all. Not Thursday evening. That's all. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty open to to whenever it is. So yeah, just uh, I'm just thinking we do it here on Jitsi on the same mm -hmm. the same thing. Yeah. Maybe we could put a, once we've decided, we could put a link on Reddit and Discord and we can yeah. send it to Kevin when he's got in touch or we've done Yeah, it. yeah. We can, just, it, so. we can just post it so anybody can join. Yeah. But anyway, we'll record it and put it up. So. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank Take you. Care, Take care. Bye. Bye. Have a nice week. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.